Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity's Nuts and Bolts webinar. My name is Jasmine Wall, and I am a part of the Birch Center team here at Branch Ed, and we are excited to host this learning event today. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on pathologizing pedagog uh, pedagogy, I'm sorry, pathologizing poverty facilitated by Dr. Tyrone Howard and Dr. Kerry Yulucci. They will spend some time enlightening us on how to break through myths about poverty in the classroom and discuss strategies for educating students most impacted by those myths. If this is your first branch ed learning event, I want to take a minute to share our mission and vision. In 2016, Branch Ed was founded with the mission to strengthen, grow, and amplify the impact of educator preparation at minority serving institutions, which is a federal des designation, with the longer range goals of both diversifying the teaching profession and intentionally addressing critical issues of educational equity for all students. Our vision is for all students to have access to diverse, highly effective educators, and we aim to do so by maxi maximizing the capacity of historically Black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, Asian and Pacific Islander serving institutions to deliver high quality educator preparation. At the end of today's presentation, I will share with you more ways that you can learn with us. Today's Nuts and Bolts webinar is a part of a series on innovative pedagogies. The intention behind the series is to inspire thinking on educational practice through lenses which center and humanize historically underrepresented and excluded learners. Each webinar features a pedagogical expert, and I'm excited to introduce today's experts. Dr. Tyrone Howard is the Pritzker Family Endowed Chair and Professor in the School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA. His re research addresses issues on race, culture, access, and educational opportunity for minoritized student populations. Professor Howard is the author of several best-selling books. He is a native of Compton, California. Professor Howard is a member of the National Academy of Education, an American Educational Research Associ Association Fellow, and has been listed by Education Week as one of the 30 most influential educational scholars in the nation on education practice, policy, and research. Just recently, Dr. Howard was voted president-elect of the American Educational Research Association. So we want to welcome Dr. Howard. And Dr. Kerry Yulucci is currently an associate professor of urban education at Roger Williams University. Her research interests include race and poverty issues in schooling and the development of culturally relevant practices. Her latest research examines the needs of refugee youth in the United States. So we are desperately in need of the work of both of these scholars and we are so honored to have them today to share their knowledge with us. Dr. Howard and Dr. Yulucci will have time for question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Please feel free as questions come to you, place them in the chat and I will visit them and read them out loud at the end of their presentation. I'm going to turn it over to your presenters today. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jasmine, for that kind uh, opening. I'm really thrilled to be with you all. I want to say good morning to Dr. Howard as well and welcome everyone who's here. Thank you all for taking an interest in our work and on this issue more broadly. Tyrone, you want to say a quick hello before we have on? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Jasmine and Susie and all the folks at Branch Ed who have been um, responsible for putting this on. This is going to be really um, fun and really surreal, just, just to, in total and full disclosure. Uh, Dr. Lucci and I go back 20-ish years. She mm -hmm. was my first PhD advisee at UCLA, my very first. Uh, always been a big fan of her and her work. And so the opportunity for us to share our work together is definitely uh, something <laughs> I'm excited about. So let's do it, Carrie. All right, sounds good. Thanks for the kind words as always. 
So let me pull up our presentation with you. We wish we could uh, be chatting with you all face to face right now, but the webinar obviously has its limitations, but please do feel free to jump in on this chat and to communicate with us as much as you are comfortable with or need to, because we really will um, look forward to answering your questions as we get through this presentation. All right, so let's take a peek here. All right, so Tyrone, you can see these slides since I can see only your face. All right, we're good. So this presentation today is based off of some work that Tyrone and I did several years ago, thinking about the way that um, poverty plays out in the lives of school children, in particular about the ways in which teacher education deals with these issues. So at the heart, uh, we see this as a kind of three-leveled problem, right? So poverty is clearly an issue in the United States. While numbers have been improving over the last short amount of time, we know that about 16% of children are growing up in poverty. We also know that poverty is disproportional, right? So communities of color are more impacted uh, or differently impacted by poverty than white kids are. However, even with that very you know, basic first statement, uh, we already have a sense of the way in which stereotypes play out when we're talking about poverty. And so one of the themes that you'll see through the presentation today is uh, kind of core to the work that Tyrone and I do is unpacking stereotypes because often they get kind of cooked into the bedrock of the way that we do things in schools and in schools of ed. So for example, while communities of color are disproportionately impacted by poverty, white kids uh, or white families make up the majority of people in poverty in the United States. I think we often, you know, kind of hand off poverty to communities of color, which does a disservice pretty much to everyone across the board, right? And allows uh, unchecked stereotypes to flourish. All right, so we have an issue of there's large numbers of children in poverty in the United States. And then we add this layer of that being in poverty, right? A child who's in poverty has consequences in school due to that poverty, right? So poverty impacts the type of experience that children have in schools. So by this, we mean that um, it shows up in a whole host of ways, right? From uh, access to good food, to stable shelter, transportation issues that come up that are part and parcel of folks in poverty who might have to rely on public transportation, for our older students who might need to work after school, before school, and they're trying to juggle um, their schooling experiences with supporting their families. So there's a really close dovetailing or overlapping of poverty issues that show up particularly in schools. All right, so stepping back again, we have lots of kids in poverty. It shows up in schools in real ways. And then of course, for Tyrone and I, the primary issue is what do we do with this as we are preparing new teachers? I'm imagining none of you work at a university where that's your school of ed, but we can all dream. So with schools of education, we've seen that all of these issues of diversity often are marginalized uh, and pedagogy is front and center. But for us, much like issues around race and language, um, we need to foreground issues of poverty as well. And so how can we start to have more robust and explicit conversations about the role of poverty in children's lives in schools of ed? So that's pretty much what we're looking at here is combining all of these issues and then thinking about how we can be more forthright um, when we're thinking about our teacher education candidates. And real briefly, before you move on to the next slide here, I think inherent in this problem that you've laid out is that education is the proverbial equalizer that education can ameliorate poverty, that oftentimes the, the, the thinking behind this is that people who are poor just didn't do education right. People who are poor just didn't apply themselves within the educational context. And those who have means, have means because they did education right. It's a real sort of superficial analysis that doesn't look at deep structural inequality, that does not look at the sort of the pervasiveness of racism. And so part of what we have to recognize is be clear about whether or not schools of education are reinforcing this narrative about education being the proverbial equalizer independent of structural factors. Absolutely. So what we're gonna to try to do over the course of our time with you this, this morning or afternoon, depending on what coast you're on, is really to front load some mythologies that we see about youth and poverty, right? So oh, there's a lot of um, uh, stereotyping that gets done about children's work ethic or their intelligence that we wanna unpack. And then we wanna move into, okay, so as teacher educators, 
what can we actually do, right? Concretely do in classes that would make a difference in the kind of ways in which uh, pre-service teachers are learning about these issues. So as we said uh, initially, please jump in at any point and ask us questions and we'll be more than happy to address them as we go. Shoop. All right, so one slight caveat. Uh, so this is our former Education Secretary Ernie Junkin, and I'm not trying to gang up on him. However, he did mention many moons ago the no excuses um, argument as it pertains to children in poverty. And I feel like it's very important to unpack at the beginning of the conversation because it'll shape the way in which we're going to walk through the presentation. So he had said in a speech once that poverty was no excuse for the experience that students have in schools. So for those of you in the audience right now, I would love to ask you point blank, what, what do you think about that, right? So with this issue in particular, Tyrone and I are walking a fine line, right? Because with any group of children, we never want to write their futures for them, right? So do children, um, do we want to make sure that children who are in poverty have access to excellent educations that doesn't limit them? Yes, unquestionably, just like we would for English language learners or refugee youth. On the flip side, to pretend as if poverty has no impact on youth, right, that it isn't really an obstacle or that schools can kind of wish it away to us is equally disingenuous, right? Again, uh, and I'm very careful when I have this conversation with undergrads because I don't want them to become self-defeating, right? Oh, these children grew up in poverty. There's only so much or there's nothing, heaven forbid, that I can do. That's not at all what we're trying to convey. However, schools can't jump over, right, communities' lack of access to jobs or safe housing or clean water or any other piece that would allow children to lead healthful lives. So we're, we're trying to keep our eyes really wide open here and be um, conscious of the realities in children's lives without diminishing them simultaneously. That makes sense, Tyrone? Makes absolute sense. And I think part of what's so powerful about this contention around the no excuses rhetoric, especially when it comes from folks who did not grow up in poverty. So the idea that somehow I know, we know what's best for those folks who are in poverty without having lived it. So a big part of this work as we'll continue to unpack it is the real power that ideology has around here. And when you talk about the pathologizing of, of poverty, there's a deep seated ideology that comes with it that suggests that these people just don't work hard enough. These people just don't apply themselves enough. These people make lots of excuses. So it's a, it's a blame the victim approach that again, is free from any real critique around structural inequalities that explain poverty and contribute to poverty and create poverty in the first place. So taken together, then what Tyrone and I are really interested in is an idea of class consciousness, right? So just like we're trying to push our teacher candidates in a direction towards race consciousness, right? Class consciousness functions similarly. So and we're seeing, <laughs> those of you who do this work, we're in a hot mess on top of a hot mess, right? In this very moment of this colorblind, we don't need to pay any attention to race types of, um, rhetoric that's going on right now, this isn't helping us at all. And we know this kind of instinctually when it comes to issues around race. However, I would say the same argument falls in line with class. To pretend that if class doesn't function, that it doesn't impact children's lives, does nothing to uplift those children, right? It's just being uh, equally kind of colorblind to the reality of their situation. So that's not what we're shooting for. We want to be um, class conscious and to let our teacher educator, excuse me, our student teachers and pre-service teachers understand that class functions in real ways in children's lives, not in determinative ways, but in ways that create obstacles. So that's where we're starting off from. Anything else to add on the kind of foundational level, Dr. Howard? No, I want to add one final point to your class consciousness, because the class consciousness requires a degree of criticality. And that criticality is important to notice that what we are not suggesting here is that we can have a class discussion because class cuts across all subgroups in a very equal way, because that doesn't. There's a gendered analysis that we'll talk about, which suggests as we look at class consciousness that, oh, by the way, women happen to be disproportionately likely to be poor than any other folks in terms of the gender spectrum. When we're talking about the, the sort of the racial analysis, oh, by the way, folks of color are three times as likely to be poor compared to, to white folks in this country. So the class consciousness 
requires a much more critical analysis of sort of where poverty hits some groups much harder than it does others. And so part of what we cannot have is, a, is have folks walk away from this conversation and say, see, we don't have to think about gender. We don't have to think about race because everybody across the sub across the, the, the different subgroups are affected by poverty. So let's just have a class conversation independent of other social identities. And to do that would be deeply, deeply unfair and, and, and really like not really uh, genuine in terms of where the impact is. And you can think of no other way to see how this plays out when it comes to looking at the contemporary sort of moment that is COVID. Because as we look at where COVID has had the greatest impacts among different subgroups, we've seen it's had a hard impact on obviously folks who are in poverty, where it comes to people from low income backgrounds are more likely to find themselves, A, being uh, disproportionately um, 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 uh, contracting the virus, B, being disproportionately, like, being disproportionately more likely to be hospitalized for the virus, and C, being disproportionately more likely to die from the virus. And oh, by the way, when you look at that through, again, through a racial lens, it's a disproportionate number of folks of color who fall into all those three categories. So now we're seeing sort of the fallout of this moment. And so one of the things we have to think about, and Carrie and I talk about this and think about this a lot in our work, and we'd love to have folks drop just a few thoughts in the chat if you can. Uh, so how has COVID exacerbated uh, sort of the, the, the gaps between the haves and the have-nots, right? Uh, how are our communities of color uh, who are in, in deep poverty affected by the moment that we have seen with COVID? Uh, and how have we seen our schools being affected by what COVID has brought about? For I'm sure many of you, uh, the initial fallout of COVID uh, only put a, a, a huge spotlight on the communities that were already suffering disproportionate disadvantage. Uh, we saw that there were communities of color, uh, low-income communities that found themselves not having the kind of devices to access technology and learning. We saw that there were lack of hotspots. Uh, there were a number of different structural issues that were in place that were all in place uh, before COVID impacted us, but COVID only, again, exacerbated those issues. So as we think about issues tied to COVID and poverty, we must think about where we are in the current moment. And because the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, I went and pulled a whole, uh, the most recent data on disproportionality this morning to make sure I had the uh, cleanest data for you. And so I just want to backtrack for one second. Uh, we're going to jump into this COVID in a little bit more specificity in a moment. But the earlier point that I made that the numerical, uh, numerically, people who are in poverty in the United States are white is true. But it's also, and it's only true because 60% of the United States is white, right? And when we compare that to African Americans, which just make up 12%, right? There's really no other way to understand that, yeah? So numerically, that's the case. That said, about based on data from this last uh, census, 2020, about 9% of white folks are in poverty, but about 23% of American Indian folks are in poverty, right? So this disproportionality is really, really clear. African Americans about 19 and a half. The gendered aspect is equally clear. Women are more frequently in poverty. Young children are more frequently in poverty and people with disabilities mm -hmm. are more um, frequently in poverty, right? So both of these realities are happening simultaneously. White folks are in poverty, yes, but communities of color are disproportionately uh, impacted. So we wanted to do this kind of catch up around COVID and poverty. This article was written several years ago and we thought this would be a good place to have a kind of updating conversation. So I had a couple of questions that I'm going to ask Dr. Ha excuse me, Tyrone in particular to basically bridge the gap from um, 19 whenever, 15 or 16 when we wrote this article. So Dr. Um, excuse me, Tyrone has already laid out a few places in which COVID has exacerbated issues of poverty, but is there other um, areas or are there other areas that you have seen that the last- Yeah, and I, I think one of the areas that we know that was all too real when COVID initially sort of became part of our reality is that the disproportionate number of folks who were essential workers. Uh, we know they were typically women of color who were in low income circumstances, right? And so when we talk about the fact that many middle class and upper middle class families 
once schools close, we're able to stay at home or adjust work schedules or begin to modify uh, sort of work uh, uh, arrangements so that they could be at home with children and provide support and provide structure and guidance around the academic tasks that they have in hand. But that was not the case for many folks who were in impoverished circumstances, right? Just the very fact that when schools close, I think what we don't recognize is that schools play so much of a, a vital hub for students. Not only are they places of learning, but they're also places where students get free breakfast. They're also places where students get free lunch. Now an increasing number of schools are providing even after school uh, types of uh, 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 food sustenance. So it became a, a huge void and you had the very families that were suffering the most, those parents and caregivers were oftentimes least likely to be in presence with their young people as COVID spawns. So again, you see how the gaps academically grow even wider because we see young people having access to schooling and education in the online space where others still struggle to get basic communication, basic connections that would allow them to be a part of the learning communities. Anything else you would add there, uh, Carrie? No, uh, you wanna talk a little bit though about communities of color and how an impacted community of color or maybe- Yeah, I mean, but what we saw disproportionately, and you know this, we know this is that again, we saw black communities uh, are, are more likely to be located in places, especially when we think about the rural South and we think about parts of the Midwest where we see black families and indigenous families and Latinx families who are less likely to have access to hotspots, less likely to have access to, to, to devices that, that were of high quality, uh, less access to have, uh, uh, less likely to have access to even uh, what we consider to be uh, functional devices, if you will. So when you begin to think about the very way in which schooling was even um, presented, uh, provided huge obstacles for lots of black and brown poor folks. Not only that, but I think what we also have to think about in this current moment is that there was still a, a deep seated fear, angst and just uncertainty that existed within many black and brown and poor communities around sort of how to respond or react to the virus. Because even as let's say, um, you know, vaccinations became more prevalent, uh, you still had some of those same communities who did not either A, have access to those kinds of vaccinations, or B, because of the history of medical racism in this country, had deep-seated concern about whether or not they should even explore or even entertain or utilize those different types of vaccinations. So part of what we have to recognize in this moment, as we talk to our students, as we talk to teachers about the work that they do uh, in this current moment, the, the deep-seated ramifications of COVID have significant implications. And for us not to begin to understand this backdrop within the face of access to opportunity, access to information, uh, would be a huge, huge misstep. So I know that mental health issues are a particular concern of yours. Have you seen overlap between kind of issues around poverty, issues around COVID and access to mental health? No doubt. And I think what we're, for, what we're starting to recognize now in this moment is that, that the disconnect that many young people suffer from not being in school, not being able to have access to teachers, to counselors, to staff members, uh, has some severe consequences that are not only academically, but they're also social and emotional. And so part of what we're seeing now as schools are, are obviously back in session is we're dealing with the ramifications of significant mental health challenges that large numbers of students suffered from. And let me be clear, mental health issues cut across all subgroups and, and I wouldn't wanna miss that point. But part of what is, is, is vital in this moment is that oftentimes folks of color and folks who grew up in low income backgrounds, issues tied to mental health are frequently stigmatized at high levels. We don't talk about depression, we don't acknowledge anxiety. We don't recognize that bipolar is a real issue. So the part of the pathologizing is that, you know, these are people who have something wrong with them. And then if you're not careful, oftentimes uh, marginalized communities will begin to internalize some of that pathology and says, well, I don't want to add additional layers of being seen as less than. So I won't talk about the fact that I've got anger issues. I won't talk about the fact that I'm deeply sad. I've seen more young people in the last couple of months who were just in very different emotional states. And so there's a need to talk about mental health supports. The reality is when you look at schools that are in high poverty areas, it is deeply disturbing and highly distressing that we don't see a, a, a cadre of psychologists we need to see more psychiatric social workers. We need to see more mental health therapists. We need to have more behavioral specialists because in many ways, what we do, part of the pathologizing of poor people is we see certain behaviors that might be quote unquote out of the normal range. And we think something's wrong with these kids. They must be pushed out without recognizing deep seated explanations that suggest that oftentimes we have young people who are quote unquote acting out, not because they're bad children, but because they're suffering the, the effects of poverty lack of stable housing, 
food insecurities, the kinds of supports that we know are essential for seeing our students be at their best. So there's a real need for us to talk about mental health. Mental health matters. We need to destigmatize mental health. We need to begin to recognize that having mental health challenges does not make someone weak or less than. It basically says that you're human and we need to start humanizing our young people and communities where issues around mental health aren't talked about as much and say this is real. It's having an impact on learning and our failure to acknowledge it in many ways makes us complicit in the problem. Beautifully said, beautifully said. To, to land this section on a bit of a more positive note, what have you seen that's been the most meaningful or positive response that you have seen in a school to address the gaps? I think, what, yeah, I think what we're seeing now, there's more conversations than I've ever seen before around mental health in schools. I, I think mm -hmm. part of what is, is, is spawning this is that if you look at some of the data from the Center for Disease Control around youth death by suicide, it's been deeply disturbing. We've seen increases in death by suicide of young people go up, primarily among boys, among our LGBTQ plus youth, and around Black, Latinx, and Indigenous populations. So I think these disturbing data are really starting to, to creep into schools where we're saying now we have to talk about this. With the American Rescue Plan, we see a lot of resources now placed in schools. Uh, I was talking to a principal just two weeks ago. She says for the first time, and she's got a school where 99% of the students are, 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 are from low-income background. For the first time, she's got three, three social workers. She said, I need about 10. Uh, and so part of what we have to do is begin to see how we begin to center uh, sort of the, the, the resources in places where there's a great need in place to make sure that those students get the kind of support they need. Part of what I've been saying, Carrie, and you know this, we have to start putting Maslow before Bloom. I've been saying that over and over again, Maslow before Bloom, until our students' most basic needs are met, food, safety, shelter, connectedness, love and belongingness, until those issues are met, you're not going to have academic performance and outcomes begin to become a priority for students. I can't concentrate when I'm hungry. I can't focus when, I know, when I'm sleeping at night. Uh, Dr. Stan Johnson, one of my other advisees who's here, who's a board member for the LA County Board of Education, knows this well. He's part of this work, ensuring that LA County, as an example, is putting those supports in place for our most vulnerable populations first. And when we do that, then we can begin to see a big impact across the board. Love it, amen. Okay, so moving on to the next section of our presentation, what we wanted to do next was to kind of unpack the stereotypes or mythologies that folks have about um, folks who are in poverty writ large. And then we're gonna try to personalize this to schools of education in particular. So Tyrone's gonna start out with this bootstraps myth. Yes. So did you, I'm sorry, what we tried to do here was really just uh, focus down on what we see people or our students bringing to us. That is baggage essentially, right? That mm -hmm need to dismiss and get out of their systems. And so we'll start here for the first couple of slides and then move on to teacher. Tyrone. So this is so vital, folks. I, we can't stress this enough because, because oftentimes teacher preparation programs or even educators in schools will argue this idea that these people, these kids, meaning poor kids, uh, they just don't apply themselves, as I mentioned, or they just don't work hard enough. And anybody can lift themselves out of poverty. And what tends to happen is this myth is rooted in this, this meritocracy notion that, you know, look, Oprah Winfrey, she was poor and she is now a billionaire, right? Uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Sotomayor, she grew up poor. She lifted herself out. So if you can just be like them, then you won't have these issues. And that mentality is far more pervasive in schools than we want to acknowledge. And it's deeply, deeply, deeply rooted in an ideology that's deficit ridden. And two, two examples come to mind that help to reinforce this. Carrie knows this, and many of you who are more seasoned know that for years, Ruby Payne had an entire cottage around how to, uh, how to educate kids growing up in poverty. And so much of that narrative was rooted in this idea that these kids are different because they just don't have the wherewithal to be successful. But if you treat them in a certain way and you understand that they don't know the value of hard work, they don't understand how to apply themselves, you can help them lift themselves out of poverty. The 21st century form of that is this notion of grit. I've told folks over and over again that Angela's, Angela Duckworth's book on grit, though she has tried to make amendments to it, has done more to set us back because the idea in it is that poor kids just need to have more grit. If they had more grit, they would do better academically. And I oftentimes say that the very notion that more poor kids need to have grit is a slap in the face of poor kids who work hard every single day. And I make this contention that Angela Duckworth and others who subscribe to that theory 
I would argue that the poor kids she argues have more grit in their pinky finger than she <laughs> probably has in her entire body. Don't tell me poor kids don't have grit because poor kids have to learn how to do what every single day, Carrie? Survive, survive. Mm -hmm. So this idea that somehow that they just don't know how to apply themselves, I think is rooted in this notion of blaming the victim. So the goal is let's disrupt this myth around anyone can lift themselves out of poverty, where in reality, in reality, I think we have to recognize that this country has a, a history of doing very little compared to other industrialized nations in terms of supporting folks who grew up in poor circumstances. So structurally, we have had all kinds of policies that have kept poor people in poor circumstances. Look at the work of Bowles and Gentis, look at the work of Jenny Oaks, look at the work of Paul Gorski. There are lots of folks who have been saying for years that we have a country that's steeped on capitalism. Talk to me, Dr. Johnson. I know you understand what I'm talking about. Capitalism that has been about making sure that there are winners and losers. And when you look at winners and losers, there's a reason why working class, poor kids who go to poor schools continue to reinforce low income, low income poor jobs. So we have to understand structural inequality in this country, how it's been baked into the fabric of the United States since its inception. So when you begin to have a more structural analysis, you recognize it's not about individual effort, because I would argue that in many ways in this country, the poorest folks are oftentimes the hardest workers when you think about what they do on a day in, day out basis. I'll say it again. The poorest folks are often the hardest workers, and that needs to be a part of our framework. This is a perfect segue into this next uh, myth that we see, which is the individual false myth, which is a version of exactly what Tyrone is talking about, right? So the myth exists that there is something inherently wrong with a person that causes them to be in poverty, yes? So uh, if this person wasn't so lazy or careless, if alcoholism wasn't impacting their lives, if they weren't being impacted by drugs, mental illness, Things that we know spread across class levels, right? So we know that middle class, upper class folks deal with alcoholism as well. So it also, the individual fault argument doesn't, doesn't map on to what we know is true regarding race or regarding gender, right? Because we know that women tend to be more in poverty. That means every woman currently in the United States has an individual fault or all American Indian folk are also have individual faults. So this argument pretty much like the previous one leaves off any kind of system analysis, right? I mean, the number one reason that folks are in poverty is that we have a not good, um, excuse me, we have too few, few jobs and not well paid enough jobs. Mm -hmm. This explains it with a lot more fidelity than issues of uh, folks have alcohol abuse problems or folks are just too lazy, right? However, this fits really nicely into the kind of colorblind mentality that we operate from right now, right? Is that we're kind of responsible for ourselves and everybody can pull themselves out by their own bootstrap. That completely is devoid of any analysis that factors in gender or race into the equation, yeah? So it's really easy, I think, for folks to get lulled into these conversations because they niche perfectly with a kind of underlying rhetoric. Agreed, Tyrone? What do you think? 100%, 1,000. And, and, and again, one of the more powerful pieces that helps to unpack this is the work of Jean Anion. Uh, when you begin to look at Anion's work, uh, she began to really lays out the lack of you know, decent paying jobs. I'm not even saying high paying jobs, decent paying jobs uh, where, you know, we see government reinforces policies that kind of keep people in these real uh, difficult circumstances. Just the minimum wage, a conversation about the minimum wage would really begin to sort of sort of help us to understand. One of the things I love that Carrie has done, Carrie's come to my class to do this on multiple occasions. She's worked with my teacher as students. She gives them a budget and she gives them a budget of how they are to function on a monthly basis with a minimum wage income. And I think for many of my students here, you know when you've done this, because you've done this for your students all the time, it's the first moment that you see the light bulb go on, when they start to think, wow, so this is how much I have to try to feed myself and two kids and pay childcare and transportation and food and groceries. And many of my students who have done that activity, they come away thinking, there's no way I can make ends meet. Uh, and you can be the hardest working person around, but it has nothing to do with your hard work. It has everything to do with systems and structures that don't allow decent wages to be a part of our framework. A third mythology is around educability. I'm going to turn this to Tyrone, but uh, I'll just 
set it up by saying we have all manner of belief systems as it as it pertains to intellect and who has it. Uh, and this is one of many places where allowing this to kind of go on unfettered is, is crippling our ability to work properly with youth, right? We can't allow students to, I mean, our teacher ed folks to believe that there's something inherently wrong with poor children that impacts them on an intellectual level. But I will stop chatting, Dr. Yes, Kier. no, you're spot on with this kid because the myth that exists is that poor kids are just flawed inherently there's genetically a difference if you want to see some work that really unpacks this see the work of Stephen Selden the, in, the work around inheriting shame and we have this whole history in this country of, of demonizing or otherizing poor people uh, to say that we can't have them interact with non-poor people because if they had some kind of genetic mixing it would bring down the quality of people who are not poor this is deeply embedded in some of the thinking that these people are just not as genetically uh, capable compared to other folks. Need to push that, need to challenge that, need to just get rid of that thinking because it exists. So that's one hand. The other piece of this myth is the fact that, you know, this is not really about a genetic piece. It's the parents who are the problem. And I can't tell you how often in schools you hear if the parents just did this, if the parents just did that, the parents don't care about education, the parents don't, parents don't value hard work. Not recognize that the very parents that we're saying that don't value hard work are oftentimes working two and three jobs to make ends meet for their families. So we cannot fall prey to this let's blame the parents argument because if we do that, the reality is we're not looking at the fact that A, again, some of the hardest working people are oftentimes the poorest folks that are that are that are that are in our country. And part of what we have to recognize, parents are oftentimes doing the absolute best that they can. It's imperative for schools to think about what are we doing to engage parents? How do we help to make parents sort of roles and, and their, their ways to participate much more uh, viable? You look at the work of, of, of Rima Reynolds, she has looked at different models around parent engagement. It shows that when we are committed to finding ways to see parents as equals, that's the key here, see parents as equals, that they participate and they're engaged and they are just as much agency ridden as any other group of parents. So the argument that somehow poor parents are just not concerned about their children's education is deeply, deeply rooted in mythology that has no real bearing. When you look at the data, poor parents are more likely to believe in education than those who are not. And so we have to begin to recognize that blaming parents makes us complicit in the problem. Finding ways to invite parents in and caregivers in has got to be our approach. What do you say, Carrie? I say amen. And I say the next slide is going to be thinking about schools writ large. So when we move away from individual teachers to schools, I think that we have an additional layer of mythology, which is this idea that schools are neutral. And I think the mythology that schools are neutral uh, occurs in lots of different areas, right? We see this with schools are neutral when it comes to history, schools are neutral when it comes to race, schools are Schools are not neutral. <laughs> Anyone who stepped foot in a school knows that they're not neutral. And this one I think is probably the most clear to unpack, right? It, it only takes a scratch on the surface to see how faulty this is. Uh, go to any different area of your city and compare the schools in the well-to-do areas and the places where folks are struggling uh, financially. And you know that this isn't true, right? So we have schools that I've been in that have pools and libraries and access to AP courses and brand new computers and schools that I've worked with, uh, one in particular when I was doing my sabbatical that was literally condemned but yet they still put children in it and the ceiling was falling in and there were rats and we couldn't go in certain spots in the buildings literally for fear it would collapse but we still had poor children in there right so uh if we I, I feel like neutrality gets used as a way to deflect uh, responsibility. To me, it's uh, a lot like colorblindness. This is the, the uh, class version. We're just like, these things are all neutral. Everyone has access to the same thing. It's, it's, it's completely not true. And we can see the reality of that um, by just scratching the surface. All right, so we're going to move into, so if we have these mythologies that are basically impacting the way that folks understand poverty, what can we do with pre-service and in-service teachers to help to show them a different way, right, to rupture some of these myths? So what we tried to do with the article is to lay out what we thought were just key questions to try to tackle with your students um, that would help to reframe uh, the way in which we're imagining race. So this first one is, we're gonna impact these in further detail in a moment, but 
what are these systemic factors, right? So really to be moving away from personal agency or per personal pathology and having students interrogate systems issues, to really look widely at the way in which poverty plays out in kids' lives, to flip the lens and start looking at assets that reside in low-income communities, and then just asking the big question about what is the role of schools in relieving poverty or in um, improving children in poverty's lives. So I'll start with this first one, which is thinking about what are the systemic factors that impact poverty. So one of the things that I try to do with my students is really personalize it to our neck of the woods. So I teach out here in Rhode Island, and I want them to look at, well, we do look at actual data about who is in poverty in Rhode Island and how it changes from community to community. Then we map on a racial lens to that and see the coordination between uh, where communities of color are and how uh, poverty impacts those communities. But then we also want to have questions I and mean, ask questions about what is making folks in poverty in poverty in this place right now, right? To give some context, because if poverty impacts different communities in different ways, it sets up different realities. Rhode Island used to be a manufacturer of jewelry. We lost a lot of those jobs. And so areas in Providence were impacted by that. Issues around transportation and how folks can't get to high paying jobs. So there's all of these places that we can turn on the spotlight to get students to think about uh, what are the webs that are essentially functioning in this very place, right? So if you're out in LA or you're in Chicago, that contribute to the poverty in which children are living in, that again, decouples the child and their family, right, from the pathology and helps to show, show right, this umbrella that's basically setting them up for the experience that they're having. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then so, so much of this is also about the lens that we bring to the work. And so much of what we have to do is talk to our students, talk to our teachers about how do you see these issues? Because the pathologizing lens only sees limitations, only sees deficits, only sees what students and families don't have. The asset-based lens that we would argue for is important because another way that poverty impacts students' lives is that to understand in particular that poverty isn't only about say material things, right? Uh, it's also about sort of the, the set of responsibilities and tasks that students have. For example, I think back to when I was younger, uh, you know, I, we were what was called latchkey kids before we had a term called latchkey kids, right? Uh, my brother and I, along with most of the kids in our neighborhoods were responsible for walking home. Uh, we came to homes that there were not parents there because our parents were out working. Now, the pathologizing way to see that is to say, wow, these are kids who are uncared for, unsupervised for, they can't possibly be in a structured environment. However, there was a high degree of structure that came with that. Each and every one of us knew what we were responsible for doing, getting younger siblings home, making sure we got home, making sure we notified our parents that we had made it home safely, doing homework, making sure that homework was corrected, reading the book. For, so there's another way that we have to rec recognize that how poverty has an impact on young people, but you have to recognize the amazing degree of structure, resilience, and determination that still exists within the context of what students do. But understand that if there are factors beyond that that are still a big part of how poverty impacts children. Uh, if you think about issues tied to the environment, again, uh, we had a report that came out with the Center for the Transformation of Schools uh, called Beyond the Schoolhouse. Uh, again, I'm going to keep mentioning Dr. Stan Johnson because he was one of the lead authors. And we looked at the rates of asthma and environmental uh, uh, pollutants and toxins that are in the air that are most likely to be situated in communities where poor families live. So just when you look at chronic absenteeism, we don't understand that issues tied to mercury and lead poison are more likely to be in those areas. Health issues, access to dental, uh, to dental uh, uh, vision and medical care are oftentimes much more challenging in rural communities where we have what we call resource deserts that have a, a real substantive impact on young people's abilities just to get access to basic medical care. Uh, issues around child labor, because in many cases what we see Young people have to work to help support the family. So when we talk about kids who are missing assignments or kids who are missing days of school, the, again, the tendency is to think these kids don't care about school. They don't want to work hard. When again, to the contrary, they're doing things to help support, you know, aging parents or sick parents or helping younger brothers and sisters, multi-generational households. Issues tied to mobility and childcare and transportation are all real issues that have a profound impact on young people's abilities to show up. Uh, I've even noticed in the course of when we were doing this hybrid learning, teachers who were hell-bent on, on students turning on their cameras 
during instruction. And I used to tell teachers, that is not the heel to die on. The fact that a student even <laughs> logged on is, is an accomplishment in and of itself. Uh, many students don't want you to see their backdrop because if I'm living in the car with my parents, I don't want you to see that. If we're living in a shelter, I don't want you to know that. So part of what we have to recognize is that issues tied to poverty have a profound impact on just the day-to-day -day ability to function and do things that many of us take for granted. So related to this flipping of the switch, the flipping of the script is the idea of doing asset mapping, right? So if you're not familiar with Yoso's work, you you want to be uh, her important work, along with Danny Solarseno's work and Luis Mall on phones of knowledge, right? There is everyone was explaining it a moment ago, right? So he comes home from school and is taking care of younger siblings and maybe preparing dinner or, or double checking homework. To me, and the slides coming up, because <laughs> again, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, the argument here is which way are you looking, right? So we can look at all the deficits, right? And index children by all that they lack or look the other direction and index all that they're doing that is stunning for their age, right? So that child who's able to come home and take responsibility and navigate the bus and speak in multiple languages and so on and so forth, yes? So uh, that's the lens that we wanna help develop. Uh, Yoso's work helps us to see this through this idea of um, capital and different forms of capital that you can both see in communities of color and in low income communities that go beyond what we typically are indexing in schools. So this has been helpful for us to see, or at least in my classes, to see the wide ways in which people are supporting one another, drawing from the um, kind of benefits and the richness of their own experience. We've done this in uh, visual ways and then in more, this is more like a philosophical way, but uh, we've had students actually take maps and map out different organizations and community centers and supports that are in particular neighborhoods to show the actual web of folks in churches and mosques, so on and so forth, that are working to support youth, right? So again, we're, we're constantly trying to chip away at the mythology that there's not much in this community or what's there isn't worth it um, because communities are making it work and are surviving, our children are getting by and there are all of these interlocking webs that help keep them afloat. We just have to see them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Damn, can schools end poverty, Dr. Howard? That's the million dollar question, isn't it, Carrie? So listen, sure? part of what we have to recognize is that I think we frequently sort of prop or put up or, or sort of uh, place schools as institutions that are going to eliminate inequality, eliminate poverty. Um, Schools did not create inequality. So I think it becomes grossly unfair to expect them to eliminate it. Uh, can schools play a role? Absolutely. Can schools play a role in helping to reduce the effects of poverty? Without a doubt, they can. But I also want to flip that on, on its head. Schools, if they're not careful, schools, if they're not reasonable, schools, if they continue to reinscribe notions of the pathology, can contribute to the exacerbation of poverty. And some might ask, what does that look like? Well, it looks like having lower expectations for students for no other reason than the fact that they come from low-income backgrounds. It comes from this whole feeling sorry for students because they have challenging circumstances at home. Part of what I ask my, my teacher ed students to do is when you understand the depths and challenges that poverty poses, we don't need pity. We don't need sorrow. We don't need sympathy because if you do that, then you start to fall into this, let me lower expectations. Let me not challenge students. Let me not put the proper supports in place. And that only keeps the vicious cycle of poverty moving in terms of how schools play a role. So schools are, are, are really pivotal in this point. To your point earlier, Carrie, schools are not neutral. Schools play a role in either helping to dismantle and play roles in eliminating poverty, or if they take this what they believe is a neutral stance, which we don't believe exists, they can play a role in helping to perpetuate and even exacerbating poverty. So schools and the individual actors in schools need to be very mindful of what are the beliefs, what are the policies and practices that we all subscribe to or that we are pushing and challenging against that suggest that do we see possibility and promise and potential and young people who are growing in poverty, or are we going to continue to pathologize them because they don't fit into this proverbial box of what we think it means to be an ideal student? So we've alluded to all of these uh, along the way, but as we're wrapping up our um, planned part of this presentation, we really want to leave with 
helping you to help your students see the danger both of these deficit beliefs, right? So deficit beliefs about the potentiality of kids in poverty, about what they can and can't do, of this othering that happens when we separate out ourselves from people who are not like us and uh, in the process are always assuming downward, yes. And then also to focus on the point that I made a moment ago, which is it depends on which way you look, right? So this uh, lens issue has always been really important to me. Uh, I'm always trying to find the promise and the potential in all situations. And I think helping our students to see that as well uh, puts them in a more, having more agency, right? In the type of work that they can do. So this is the article that this uh, presentation has come from. So if you're interested in it, that's how you can find it. 2015, I couldn't quite remember. And then Dr. Howard and I are writing and have written other things. So if you're interested in other pieces of our work, uh, I, Tara's laughing because he's like, is she going to say it? I have a book coming out. In the and Dr. Howard has several. These are just a few. So thank you so much for your time and attention. We're happy we had this opportunity to be with you. And I'm going to unshare and turn it back over to Jasmine so she can share the questions. Dr. Howard, Dr. Yuluchi, thank you so much. I'm, I don't want to say I'm triggered a little bit. I'm joining Branch Ed coming straight from the school systems where um, core values were grit and other things like that. And um, well, I'm not, I'm not there anymore. I'm here because I believe that we needed a change. Um, I'm going to jump to the questions because I don't want to take up the time asking questions. I do have a question, but I'm going to share this question first from Jennifer Wallace. Um, she says that message about disparity in education is always present at PDs. However, once teachers get in the classrooms, they revert to a watered down curriculum. What shall we do? Dr. Lucci, take it on. So I'm, I want to make sure I understand the question. So disparities um, between, let's say, I, I'm not sure if I entirely understand it. Yeah, so let me tell you, what I, what I understood that to be is that oftentimes, and I've seen this a lot, so you we have PDs that are frequently designed to help eradicate some of the mentalities or practices that we see in place. But then when you see folks who go back to the classrooms, they go back to the same didactic sort of watered down approaches to curriculum and instruction. How do we respond to that? I think one of the ways we respond to that is we have to be willing to hold accountable folks for what they say that they do by doing more actual observations. If you look at the, the, the research on leadership, what really adaptive leaders do, is they spend lots of time in classrooms watching, observing, not judging, but watching, observing, and looking for ways to support teachers in classrooms. So when they see this sort of watered down curriculum, there's ways to begin to have, ask, have conversation with staff about, you know, how are you scaffolding this? How are you reaching some of your more advanced learners? How are you individualizing structures for, uh, for, your, for your, your, your language learners? So part of it requires having presence in classrooms so we can see the quality of instruction and then provide supports. It's not an aha gotcha moment, but making sure that we're providing teachers examples of what the what instruction can look like and it's not being watered down. We know that the watered down helps no one. So um, I'm, I, I hear what you're saying and thank you for translating it, of having this sense that, all right, there are gaps and thus we have to kind of niche our instruction to the gaps. That hasn't really worked, right? We know that that really hasn't worked and that this constant like downward adjusting of curriculum has backfired, right? We've seen that in reading a lot. So I think you got a lot. I mean, if you're trying to break that mold and uh, jump out there and do stuff that's uh, rigorous and thoughtful, I think we have a lot of evidence that shows that that is going to be more useful for youth than this, you know, drill and kill kind of stuff. Uh -huh. I'll add uh, a question while we wait for a few others. Um, going back to my point about schools um, whose core values and the values that they use um, to help uh, quote unquote encourage students such as grit, discipline, have leadership. We're preparing uh, in-service teachers or pre-service teachers to go and combat these mythologies. But what about districts? What about school leaders who are designing these core values? What do we then tell teachers who are going into schools where these core values are set? 
that are kind of steeped in the assumptions and uh, the mythologies of poverty that you all have described? What do we tell those teachers to do when those are the core values that schools and districts are giving um, for students to learn? How do, how do teachers go up against that um, without losing their job? <laughs> yeah, that's a question, right? So one of the things I oftentimes tell my beginning, my novice teachers is that when they're interviewing, that the interview process is a two-way street. Not only are they assessing you, but you're assessing them. And if a district or a school has those values that just don't sit well with you, then you have to ask yourself this fundamental question, is this the right place for me? And it's okay to say it's not because you'd rather know that on the front end as opposed to getting there and recognizing that you can't be your authentic self. Second thing I add to that, for those who are in those districts where those core values are already in place, I maintain some of the most amazing teachers are highly, highly subversive. My principal friends don't like when I say this, but they're subversive. They go in that room, they close that door, and they do what they know is best for their students. Regardless of what all the posters are in the walls and the hallway that talk about grit and no excuses and things of that nature, they understand their students well, they connect to them well, and they give them what they need. They meet them where they are, and they don't fly, in the, and they fly in the face of all these things that, that suggest that it's about individual effort. They understand outside of school factors that have an impact on them in the day-to-day -day realities. And I would say that um, as much as our, I'm not gonna say wine, but as much as our students complain when we go on these tears about philosophy and belief systems, that this is critical, right? It, it's because folks go through teacher ed without having these conversations that they become administrators down the road. <laughs> so hold tight, folks, hold tight. I mean, I, I swear, <laughs> I teach a class right now on just foundations of social identity. And some days I know my students are like, tell me how to teach math. Mm -hmm. But we drown them, we drown them purposefully because I don't care how well you can teach math if you don't like brown children, right? Like it simply doesn't matter. So uh, hold tight, tight, tight to the anchors and the belief systems that you have about the youth that you work with. And again, apple and tree and all, I tell my student teachers, shut the door. <laughs> shut the door and do what you have to do in your classroom that you can live with yourself and that you can be proud that you're a teacher of these children um, and that it's good enough for your own personal children, right? Like if, if this kind of instruction isn't good enough for my boys, it's not good enough for any boys. So uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm, again, I'm not trying preach subversiveness or mm -hmm. I am carrying I'm, I'm preaching it and I don't mind saying that I'm preaching it because I think it can be really really transformative so there I said it not okay carrying. I'm going to watch on <laughs> and be brave too be some thank you folks. thank be you for that response we are running out of time but I'm going to we have a few more questions um Amy asks other than teaching as a subversive activity by Neil Postman do you have readings or resources for teachers who are totally on board, on board with being subversive. <laughs> oh, so I'm gonna give a shameless plug right here while Carrie's looking at her, 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 um, <laughs> um, her library. Listen, one word that I think is so vital and I think is inherent in what Karen and I have talked about that the teachers who are subversive, one of the things that they do really well, they cultivate powerful, culturally informed relationships. Relationships matter, relationships matter, relationships matter. I tell my pre-service teachers, at the end of the day, students don't care what you know, and so they know that you care. So there's this little shameless plug, this book that Jalil Howard and myself wrote that's called No More Teaching Without Positive Relationships. I think that's what is vital and instrumental to helping to at least begin to think about what subversive teaching can look like. Relationships, they matter. Yeah, the, the kind of OG version of that is Dream Keepers. So um, that one is always at the top of my list of just thinking about ways in which, particularly with like, um, excuse me, black and brown children, folks can uh, do better work, uh, Emden's work, uh, folks who work in the hood. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's an arsenal of stuff out right now. I'm yep. Yep. Start Where You Are But Don't Stay There by Rich Milner. Uh, nice. Subtractive Very Schooling nice. by uh, Angela Valenzuela is another one. There you go. Fantastic. Or you can read this upcoming book by Alucci and Spencer, Spencer and Alucci, that is going to be like an amazing, it's an amazing book. I've read it. It's, it's look, you got to get it. Anti-Blackness. Thank you, dear. Come on yes. now. Yes, for all these plugs and the scholarship. Thank you. I'm so glad we are sharing this on LinkedIn. So if you all didn't get to capture those resources and those publications, you can rewatch this on LinkedIn and, and get those books down. I know that I will be doing that. Um, one more question. What are some methods 
core practices for educator preparation programs to use to address diversity, equity, and, and inclusion with our pre-service teachers to understand poverty. I can repeat that. What are some methods or practices for educator prep programs to use to address DEI with our pre-service teachers to understand poverty? Tarun? Yeah, I think so much of this work starts with us. I think some of the more powerful examples that I've seen around this in teacher education programs, to Carrie's earlier point, a lot of folks want to come and say, teach me how to teach math. Show me how to do classroom management. It starts with some self-reflection work. And so some of the more powerful models I've seen is when you engage in uh, intergroup dialogue discussion where folks deal with their own stuff, our own biases, because we bring all that stuff to the classroom. If I'm coming to a teacher education program thinking that immigrant kids are somehow less than, everything I do, everything I say, everything you teach me will be through that lens. But if you get me into a real sort of thoughtful reflection session saying, what do I think about immigrant folks and where did that stuff come from? And hearing from folks in my class who are immigrants and having them tell their stories that begins to help me think about shifting my, my thinking, that's important. So it's not always about the reading about the others. It's starting here. What's in my, my head and my heart? And if I don't do that self-reflective work, not just a one-off kind of deal, but in an ongoing way, anything you try to do is going to be sort of all for not because we're still operating from these lenses that we bring to our work every single day. So I think it's about self-reflection. You look at the work of Rita Coley, that's another one. Rita Coley has written about, you know, how you engage in these activities with teacher educators and with teacher education students that start with a core set of questions that you start asking yourself about, what is it I think about the communities I teach in? What do I think about people in poverty? What do I think about why they're in poverty? What do I think about folks who are experiencing homelessness? All that stuff is what is the foundational part for how we think about this work. And I would say that once you do that work, then hearing other people's stories is really important too. So something that I've now built into all the teacher ed classes that I have are a series of memoirs. So students read uh, in foundation, in like in a foundation psychology, excuse me, a foundations social identity class, memoirs written by Syrian refugees and folks who grew up on the border going back and forth between Mexico, African-American youth growing up in Chicago, right? And that follows in the critical race theory trans tradition, which I know is on fire right now of listening to people narrate their lives from the first person perspective. And that's been really important. The students get to choose which memoirs they wanna read. They read them with one another in small groups over the course of the semester. And that's just helped to add more voices um, to the work that we're doing and to make sure that they're authentic. Okay. Well said. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Howard, Dr. Yulucci, for your, I mean, the, the knowledge is priceless, the practices, um, and I'm sure that everyone here today is going to go back and reflect. Please share um, what you've heard today. Um, I'm going to post um, a quick poll just so that we can share with Dr. Yulucci and Dr. Howard on how satisfied we were with today's learning. Um, and in, in addition to that, um, I am going to, let's see, I'm sorry that you all can see. Uh, can you all see the poll on my screen or no, just mm -hmm. the uh, QR code? I can There's see. a, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Yulucci. I can see it, but I'm not sure if your participants can. Okay, <laughs> if hopefully my participants can see a um, QR code so that if you love what you heard today and was excited about today's learning, you plan on taking it back. We have other learning events, scan our QR code, stay in touch with us. We have other nuts and bolts workshops coming up um, on Afrocentric pedagogy. We have a summit coming up on critical reflection, really amazing things that you can use and learn about and share with others um, who are in the work of educator preparation. Again, we thank you, Dr. Yulucci, Dr. Howard, so much for spending your time with us. Um, we will share their information, how you can get in contact with them via email if you've registered for today's webinar. Um, and again, please stay in touch with us. And we really appreciate you spending your lunchtime with us to come and learn today. And we wish you all all a fabulous day and thank you again for spending your time with Branch Ed and we'll see you all soon. Thank you Jasmine for inviting us. Thank you all for coming. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You all be well. Excellent. Thank you.